Are you excited? Yes. Are you ready for the Word of God? Yes. Remember, I'm a nervous preacher when you don't help me preach. So if you go silent, I'm going to ask you to check for your pulse tonight. Now today, I'm going to be... <laughs> already checking. Today, I'm going to be talking about life. 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 I was on, I was on the plane this morning and... And uh, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, I prepared this word this morning, so I hope the Lord helps me uh, put this, uh, uh, to communicate this clearly, um, because I have not uh, um, had time to season this word anywhere else, so I was on the plane, and I was just saying, God, what do you want to talk about? And the Lord just said, I want to talk about life. And, and would you, uh, for a second, just look at the person next to you, smile at them, and say, Get a life. <laughs> you thought they were going to say something nice, but they will later. I want to challenge us this afternoon with something. But before we do, I want to share a dream I had before I went to Portugal. On Thursday night, the night before uh, I was due to go to Portugal. Was it Thursday I had this dream or Wednesday? Thursday. We'll just say Thursday. If I'm wrong, my wife will likely correct me. She's, she's very gifted with times and dates and, and directions and all sorts of things. I just, I'm just, you know. And so here I am, Thursday night, I have this dream. And in this dream, I'm going to the pastor of Portugal who I had not met. And he just said to me, Tommy, thank you so much for coming to our nation. We've just had Revive Artos here. I know. Revive Artos. So I wake up from this dream, and I'm, you know, the moment I wake up, the pastor from Portugal calls me, and he says, Tommy, I'm so glad you're coming. Thank you so much for coming. And I'm half asleep, so I said, oh, I just had a dream about you. And, and I, I normally am not prone to share dreams that quickly. I would normally weigh it, but because I was half tired, I said, oh, hi, you know, and you know when you've just woken up and you're trying to pretend you're awake? So you, so you kind of embolden your voice a little bit. You're like, hi, how are you? And you shout louder just because that's what awake people apparently sound like they're doing. So I said, yeah, hi, yeah, we've, we've just, uh, I just had a dream about you. He said, uh, he said, okay. And this is a man I've never spoken to on the phone before, bearing in mind. I didn't even say, hi, my name is. I just said, hi, I just had a dream about you. And he said, what was it? I said, yeah, I, I, uh, you came to me. He said, thank you for coming to Portugal. You know, we just have Revive Artos here. And he said, okay. <laughs> I said, well, I just wanted to let you know. I'll see you Friday. Bye. And put down the phone. And I went back to sleep. And when I woke up, I checked everywhere for this word Artos. I was trying, what does Artos mean? And then all of a sudden, I'm reading the scripture and I'm looking at the scripture that's, that Christ says, I am the bread of life. And the Greek word for bread is artos. That got my attention. And so when the Lord was speaking to me about how we have just had revive artos here, I believe what the Lord is speaking about is he's speaking about a revival of fresh bread and fresh manna that's coming from heaven that we don't have to store up anymore yesterday's word or yesterday's manna. We can receive fresh artos and fresh word and fresh bread right where we are. And if he calls himself the bread of life, that means that when you eat of him, the Bible says you'll never hunger again. And the Bible says when you drink of him, you'll never thirst again. And so I want to talk about life, but I'm going to talk about it from a different angle today. I'm going to share on it from the perspective. Actually, I'm going to pose to you a question. Why did Jesus come? 2,000 years ago, he came into the earth. And I, I think we have lost somewhere along the line, we've lost the relevance of why he actually came. You know, there's an old story that I like, to, I like to share, and this old story was about a healing river. It's not a true story, but there was a man who found a healing river in a desert somewhere. He just found this river, and he comes to this river, and he gets healed in this river. He had, I don't know, some disease, and the disease went. And all of a sudden, he started telling everybody about this river. Lo and behold, like any healing river, 
Thousands upon thousands of people became, began to come. Thousands of people became millions of people because they were all getting healed in the healing river. All of a sudden, one of the men got a really clever idea. He said, you know what? Let's build hotels here. So when the people come to the river, they can have a place to stay at night. So they built hotels around the river. So when people come to the river, they don't have to travel hours or days to get back home. They could spend the night and they get healed in the river. And then somebody else had a really good idea. He said, let's build restaurants here. So when they come and they get healed and they sleep, at least they have food to eat. So they built restaurants all around the place. And then somebody else had a really good idea. Let's build merchandise. So that when they come and they get healed in the river, I don't know, they can pick up a little uh, uh, river mascot. I don't know, they, they just, uh, you know, ch uh, a foam finger or whatever. And so they, they start building infrastructure, shops, restaurants. Centuries later, a man heard from his great, 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 great grandfather about this healing river, travels to this far distant land, and he travels to this, and now it's not just a river, it's a big city, and he says, excuse me, I'm looking for the river. And one of the locals said, what river? Because they got so busy building around the river that they forgot why the river was there in the first place. And there is a reason, folks, there's a reason why the Bible says that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of our God. Because wherever there are rivers, there are cities. Everybody knows this. Where there's a water, there's a major city. That's why Egypt was powerful, not because of its soldiers or its battalions. No, it was powerful because it had the River Nile. London is powerful because we have the River Thames. You know, we build cities. We tend to build cities around water because where there's water, it's said there's life. Amen? And so I want to talk today about life, and I want to talk about it from a perspective of why did Jesus actually come? If we can get rid of all the clutter we've put upon our teaching and our preaching, and you know, our 10 steps to success, we climb all 10. Then there are 50 steps to a divine breakthrough, we climb the 50 steps to a divine breakthrough. Then there are 100 steps more to getting what you need from God. So you climb all 100 steps, and before you, you know you need healing because you've climbed so many steps, your, your, your feet are tired. What if we got back to the simplicity of the gospel and we asked ourselves this question, why did Jesus actually come? So many people think he came to build a church. No, it's not why he came. It's what he did. It's not why he came. So many people think he came to establish great worship. No, some people think he came because he wanted us to have meetings and tea committees about who's going to serve the poor. No. The Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Hallelujah. Christ didn't come for us to get a bigger church. Christ didn't come for us to get a better building. Christ didn't even come just so we could win souls. I believe winning souls is a byproduct of, of new life. Christ came that we might have life, and we might have so much life that it cannot just be kept with us. We have to share that life with other people around us. I love what the book of, I love that amen, sir. Thank you so much for that. That's a powerful amen. Everybody say amen like he said amen from now on. Yay, I like that. That's why the Bible begins to tell us about Joshua. And he says to Joshua, he says, hey, Joshua, if you meditate on this law day and night, if you stick your head in this book of the law and you meditate and be careful to do everything that's written therein, he says, then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have a good success. And you know what? I believe the difference between prosperity and success is prosperity is when God gives you enough. Success is when God gives you too much. Oh, come on. Somebody say, God, I don't want too much. I just want okay. If you just want okay, you're greedy. Hello? Because the Bible says a good father leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So the kind of blessing God's going to give you is going to be generational. God's going to bless you to the third. He, he actually says, I bless to the thousandth generation. That means Abraham was so blessed, Isaac didn't need a job. 
His son Jacob retired before he was even born. Oh, come on. I'm talking about the kind of blessing. And some say, can God ever bless you too much? Well, Malachi says he can. Malachi says he'll bless you to the point that there won't be room enough to receive it. Do you know what that means? That means you're going to have to accommodate somebody else in your breakthrough. Come on. We have got to get used to a super abundant God. And we've got to get used to a God who walks on streets paved with gold as if they were cement. This is not an average God. This is not a mediocre God. This is not a God who desires for us to just live humble little lives. No. He didn't even say, you will lend to your uh, neighbor or you'll lend to Bob who's always asking for money. No, that's not what he said. He said, you'll lend to nations. In other words, he says, the next time a nation gets into debt, I'm so going to bless you that you're going to have the capacity to foot the bill. Well, if you don't say amen, I'll take it. He says, I've come that you might have life and not just have life, uh, uh, you might enjoy life. Oh, try telling Christians to enjoy life. Dear God, we think the more miserable we are, the more anointed we are. (laughs) But he says, no, I want you to have life, and I don't just want you to have life. He says, I want you to enjoy life. And then he says, I don't just want you to enjoy life. I want you to enjoy it to the point that it's bursting out of you. That's what we call going from flow to overflow. That's when it's so abundant. The goodness of God is so abundant that it's accidentally spilling into other people's lives. You become an incidental blessing. I, you know, I get, I don't like when Christians say they fired me from my job because, of I, because I'm a Christian. I don't like that. Do you know what the Bible says about Joseph? It said that the house of Potiphar was blessed because of Joseph. That means even when the accusation came, Potiphar didn't want to believe it because every time Joseph just sat in the living room, the fridge would be full. Heinz beans will be lining the cupboards. Come on. Things will just be flowing and working and operating. Because he was flowing from a place of the life of God. And it's high time you and I as Christians begin to understand the life of God that's on the inside of us. I traveled today and listen, I'm wearing the same practically the same clothes I took from the airport, so I still got my passport here. This is what I use to get into a country. Without this, it doesn't matter how cool I am. Nobody's letting me anywhere. The moment they see my passport and it lines up with who I am, They let me through. What is a passport? A passport is an image. A passport is an image. That when the image lines up with the person who owns the passport... They are, la- they are legally allowed to pass into the portal. Man, you guys make me want to preach today. When you and I take on the life of Christ and we decide to be born again, The Bible says he conforms us into his image. Why? Because the only way you are going to pass 
the portal or passport is if the image lines up. If, in other words, if they look at my passport portal and they see a white dude <laughs> how many know I'm not going through <laughs> the name may line up but if the image doesn't line up they, this is what they did when they saw me they did this and they did this and then they told me do this take off your glasses I took them off and they did this and they did this and as long as the image lined up, I was allowed to pass port. I was allowed to pass the port. When we get born again, the Bible says we become a new creation. Oh, hallelujah. We go, we go from glory to glory. We, we translate into the very image of Christ. So when the Father sees us, the Father sees Christ, and we get to pass the portal. Now, so many of us, when we pass the portal, and we become what the Bible comes, calls born again, it is, it is important for us to understand what we are born again into. Because the second thing I had to do when I passed the port, some say pass the port, because that's all salvation really is, is stepping from death to life. It's being translated into another realm. Are you hearing this? So even though you're here physically, spiritually you're seated in Christ, in heavenly places. Paul said, you think you're sitting next to Paul. If Paul was sitting right next to you, Paul would look at you and say, you think you're sitting next to Paul? You've, you're mistaken. The life I live, it's no longer me living it, but the Christ living it on the inside of me. I have passed the port. When you and I come into another nation, I'm going too fast, I'll come back to this. Christ wants us to begin to live the Christian life. And Christianity is not to be mistaken for cruise control. You know, when I got saved, it was around the time people were saying, believe in Christ because your life will be better. And so you believe in Christ, and then this is what you do. You put your life on cruise control, right? And you kind of sing, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> right? And you just let go of everything, and you stop doing everything, and you just expect Christ to come in and do everything. It's called amazing grace. It was never called a lazy grace. <laughs> that means there is a responsibility that I now carry as a new creation in Christ to go from being born again as a baby to now standing in the maturity of my citizenship. Christ became our righteousness, yes. He did not become our right choices. Are you following that? Christ on the cross, he became our righteousness, absolutely he did. But he did not become our right choices. When I first got saved, I wore a Satan-proof jacket for about three days. Let me know what I'm talking about. Well, you thought the devil can't touch me now. <laughs> and you kind of walk a bit different. You act like everything is a chest issue. You just look, you look at life differently. And then one day you realize you're still a human being. You realize you're still in the flesh. It just hits you like a, 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 a ton of bricks and you feel conviction. 
Because Christ became our righteousness, he did not become our right choices. Life is a choice. If I could break down every choice in your life, somebody, somebody, if somebody was to come to me and say, what choice am I supposed to make next with my life? Can I tell you what your next choice should be? Your next choice shouldn't be a new husband or a new wife. It shouldn't be a new car or a new house. It shouldn't be a new job. Can I tell you what your next choice should be? Your next choice should be Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. See, I set before you today life. He didn't just say life. This is a point where people get mad. He said life and prosperity. My God, I wish I could, I could, I could talk to a, a real church today. He said Life and prosperity. And if you hate the word prosperity, you're going to hate life. Because life is about being condemned to prosper. I don't know about you. I want to be condemned to prosperity. If God, if God just said, I condemn you to success. Amen. I'm going, brother. You, he says, I lay before you I was two, two choices with your life. Report. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to simplify every choice you're ever going to have to make as a Christian believer from today on. You're never going to have to make any other decision but these two decisions. Life and prosperity or death and adversity. And then he says, in case, in case you don't know what to do with those two very simple choices, I'm going to hold out life a little bit further. I'm going to wave it in your face. I'm going to say, please. For the love of God, choose life. It would seem stupid for anybody to give me life and death and to actually have to tell me to choose life. But can I tell you, God laid the same decision right from the beginning of time to Adam. And Adam chose death over life. I often ask myself, when I read the scripture in the book of Exodus and I saw these children of Israel and Moses comes to them and he's like, hey guys, I got the solution you've been looking for. You've been here for too long, thousands of years in slavery. Listen, God's going to take you to a land. My God, it's going to flow with milk. It's going to flow with honey. You're going to be so blessed you don't know what to do with it. He's going to drive out the parasites, the Jebusites, every pesticide. <laughs> My God, you're just going to go free. and You're going to be entrepreneurs. You're going to own your own success. You're going to decide when you want to wake up. You're going to decide when you want to go to sleep. Nobody's going to have to tell you it's 9 a.m. Why aren't you doing your shift today? Nobody's ever going to tell you again when to go to work or when to come home. Nobody's ever going to superimpose stringent taxes upon your life so that, that the government owns 30 to 40 percent of your income and then you have to go fetch your own bricks and your own slime. I mean, I'm telling you, you guys are going to be blessed. You're going to be so glad when you get there. And the children of Israel said, let's go. Of course. Choose life. So he said, yeah, let's go. But on the way to life, they said, oh, that we were in Egypt. You know, in Egypt, we at least knew 
when our next salary was coming in. In Egypt, we at least knew when our leeks and our onions were coming, and leeks and onions. God's talking about milk and honey, and you're talking about leeks and onions. They're saying, please, please, can we just go? Maybe we can go back to our slave masters and just tell them to take us back and tell them we're sorry and please just put me under the whip again. I need that whip. I need it to to motivate me. I mean, you read that scripture and you think, either these people are hooked on self-abuse. They're absolutely crazy. Or there's something deeper about this story that we're not yet fully getting. Progress a little bit further to another man who baffles me, a man by the name of Samson. God tells him he's going to be great. God tells him he's going to deliver people from stuff, Philistines, and do all these mighty things. And here he falls in love with a woman. Now, let me tell you something about who you should marry. How many are you single in this house? Don't be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed. You're only single temporal. It's a temporal thing. Let me tell you. How do you choose the right spouse? Choose a life man, not a death man. Choose somebody who is alive in Christ and not dead. Don't marry somebody just because they have a pulse. Oh, God help me preach. Don't marry somebody just because they attend Mass once a month. If you marry that person who attends Mass once, you're the one that's going to have to keep up his spiritual life. Marry life. Don't marry death. It's a hole that you'll have to fill for the rest of your life. Samson married death. He looked at Delilah every day and he was just with her. He was just loving on her. Can you imagine something that just, just baffles me when I read the story? Samson says, Delilah says, please tell me, how can you be weakened? He says, Tell me, what's the secret? What is the secret to your strength? What is making you so strong? What is it? I need to know. I just need to know. Well, why do you need to know that? I just, I just, I just, I love you, babe, and I just want to, I just want to know. What's, what makes you so strong? Do you know, in Sunday school, they, they messed it up because I was, I was taught to draw Samson, and we drew a man with muscles, a six-pack, and abs, Right? An Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of guy whose, whose arms are like my thighs, whose six-pack is like, just like craters. And whose chest is just, boom, just like two twin bones. That's who I drew when I drew Samson. But can I tell you something? If Samson was really that strong, why would everybody be asking for the key to his strength? That tells me Samson's strength was not apparent. Because if it was apparent, why is everybody saying, what makes you so strong? Obviously, he'd say, my muscles. Samson's strength was the God life that was living on the inside of him. And let me tell you something that happened. In a moment, that woman looked at him and he said, oh, you know, if you tie my, if you tie my braids up, I'll be weak like any other man, right? So she goes, ooh, okay. He's sleeping. She sneaks in, ties up the hair, goes out, stands at the door. Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon us. He, he, he wakes up. <laughs> the next night, she cries again. She says, Samson, you lied to me. He said, okay, tie my hands up, and I'll be weak as any man. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Ties his hands up. Samson, the Philistines are upon us. Breaks it off. Kills him. Can I tell you something, Tony? I read this almost in suspended disbelief. 
I mean, I just couldn't believe that a man could be so stupid. Because by the second time, something in me would say, she's trying to kill you. But he, time after time, he sees her coming. He knows what she's trying to do. But for some reason, he still divulges the secret to his strength. And I read this story. I said, God, is this, is this, man, is this man silly? Is something wrong with him? Is he not smart? And he said, no. It's not that he's not smart. Have you ever loved someone that you knew was bad for you? <laughs> oh, look, the amens go down right now. Everyone's like, oh, no. I was born again from the womb. Hallelujah. <laughs> Have you ever loved someone that you knew was bad for you? I mean, everybody told you they were bad. I mean, the first time you saw them shout at you, or shout at their mom. You just said, oh, you know, that's just their mom. They're always like that with their mom. You knew it was bad for you, but you still went head over heels into it anyway. Because Samson was attracted, but he was also afflicted. Is it possible that death can be so attractive that we don't mind being burned by the flame as long as we can get close enough to the heat. There's a reason he said choose life. Because I believe Satan has the capacity to make death look like life. He has the capacity to make things that seem beautiful, beautiful. For he, the Bible says, presents himself as an angel of light to deceive the very elect. But let me tell you, everybody in life will have these two choices, life and death. Those are the only two choices that we'll ever have to make. Anytime you get into an argument or I get into an argument with my wife, I, I ask myself, is this argument onto life or is it onto death? Come on, don't shout me down because I'm teaching good. I ask myself, is this argument going to lead to life or is it going to lead to death? If it's going to lead to death, I moonwalk like Michael Jackson out of that conversation. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> two choices, life and death. Look at the person next to you say, you only have two choices. <laughs> Don't overcomplicate life. Jeremiah 21 verse 8 says this, You shall also say to this people, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. If I was to ask you, if I was to ask you to draw a symbol that represents death to everybody, many of us will get very creative. I'd imagine somebody would likely draw a skull. I'd imagine somebody would likely draw a noose, a cross, blood. But if I was to ask you to draw a symbol for life, what would you draw? It's amazing to me that when I go on my phone and I send a text message, that there's an emoji. When I write death, there's an emoji for that. But there's no emoji for life. Because life, unlike death, is not quantifiable. There is no symbology for it, and that's why people find it hard to live it. Breathing is easy. Living is hard. When I, I was in a, a meeting somebody one day, and um, we were having a meeting, I can't remember what it was about, and I asked them, hey, you know, what are you doing with, with your life right now? And she says, you know, I'm just trying to make a living. And I responded, isn't that expensive? 
she looked at me, she said, well, you know, tell me, what are you talking about? At what expense? Well, I said, if you're spending all your life trying to make a living, then at what point do you get the payout? I remember meeting a young, a young girl in town, and you know, she, I was telling her about the Lord, and she just got angry with me. I mean, it was, it was blue murder. She was actually there to sell me paintballing. How many of you met those people on the street that tell you, come to paintballing, it's amazing? Because I said, I'll come to paintballing, but I've got something better for you. So I told her about you know, the message of Christ's love, and she got really angry with me. She, she, the moment I said, Jesus, just the word, cause an immediate knee-jerk manifestation. And she said, well, you know, I'm just not ready to give my life to Christ yet. I said, well, that's okay. She said, well, no, you can't, you can't come up to me and tell me what to do and what not to do with my life. I'm trying to live my life to the full. And I merely said, are you full yet? She looked flabbergasted at me. She could not come up with an answer. And yet there are people who ascribe to this philosophy, even in the church, we're trying to live our life to the full. Well, the question is, are you full yet? And this is the same thing we do every day of our life. We, we, we you know, use all our health, hopefully, to get wealth. And by the time we got wealth, we use all our, our wealth to get health again. And we're on this never-ending rat race of trying to achieve something that we miss the fullness of the gospel message of Christ. That if we were made to live life to the full, Christ wouldn't call himself life and Christ wouldn't come to live inside of us as life. I put to you this evening that this realm that we now occupy, this realm called earth that we are living in, that we call life, is nothing more than a slow death. I put to you that we are not living, we're merely dying in slow motion. Because the truth about life, and one of the things I've realized, is life is not a thing. Life is a person. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 20 says, And that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life. You know, I've heard people say this, you know, I just want to meet the love of my life. I just, what are you waiting for? I'm just waiting to meet the love of my life. And when I meet the love of my life, my God, I'm just going to be so happy. Right? And then you meet the love of your life. And you get married. And you realize that 90% of marriage is you trying to take each other's life. That's a joke. <laughs> or is it? <laughs> because life is not a destination. Jesus meets a woman at a well. And he says to her, he says, hey, honey, give me a drink. And she said, got nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. She says, if you knew the gift of God, you'd ask him, and he would have given you living waters. The kind of waters, he says, you're going to get from him. You'll never have to come back to this well to drink again. She thought that Jesus was talking about a literal well. But Jesus switched on her and showed her that he was just speaking metaphorically he was using parables to parallel life with a, a a fable a story he said go call your husband she said i, I don't 
I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you're right. You've been married five times. In other words, you've been trying to live your life to the full. You've been trying to meet the love of your life. You've made everything else your life, but you don't realize that on the inside of every human being is a God-shaped hole. You can try and fill it with drugs, sex, children, parents, money, cars, houses, and you could even get all of that and still never even scratch the surface of your truest hunger. Living on the inside of every individual, every single person that goes to the shop and buys their handbag and buys their Michael Kors watches and their Gucci and Prada and their Louboutin shoes and all of these things and men who search magazines for the latest BMW 5 Series living on the inside of them is a God-shaped hole that not enough aluminum metal can fill. Only God can fill that hole. You can only hear the roar of an engine so many times before you realize you're hungry. You can only hear I love you so many times from a spouse before you realize you're hungry. And the issue is, and the reason why life seems to mess us up is because we're trying to get from life what we can only get from God. And we're placing all of these unrealistic expectations on one another to fill a hole that none of us could ever fill. I remember one day, my God, I thought, Tommy, you, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna bless your wife real good. So I went out, my God, I just bought... I bought some roses, I bought some flowers, I did some things, and I, I remember bringing them all home, and, and just, I gave them to my wife. I just thought, yeah, man, I feel good about myself. Amen, hallelujah. I, I, just, I just lavished her with something special. You know what she said? She went, oh, oh, you my husband so nice. That's what she says, let's take off. <laughs> You know, my husband's so nice. Thank you, baby. Thank you, baby. You know, she said immediately after, this is what she said. She said, and babe, next time we go out, can we do this, 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 and this? I looked, I said, you mean there's a next time? I thought that was it. I thought I'd done it. Touchdown. I mean, this will last me for at least two months. I'm never going to have to take her out again. But she's talking about the next time. And I realize I, nev I will never have enough to fulfill what she needs. Oh, it's the most freeing day of your life. <laughs> it is the most freeing day of your life. The day you realize you'll never have enough to fulfill what your partner needs. You'll never have enough to fulfill what your children need. You were never made to. You were never built to. You were never formed to fulfill those needs. Only God can fulfill those desires. And when we learn that, we give ourselves over to him. And he takes the reins, and he takes responsibility over our decisions in our everyday. There are four words for life, and I'm not uh, by any means a Bible scholar, so if I say these words wrong, uh, forgive me. But these are the four Greek words for life in the Bible. The first one is suki, 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 suki. Uh, uh, suk, is it suk, pasuk? Who's Greek here? Suk, suke, suke? Let's go with suke. Suki, suki. Let's go with suki. The first one <laughs> is suki. It means a life. It means life in the soul. It means just living everyday life. The second word is bios. It means the pleasures of life. The third one is anastrophe. It means manner of life. And the fourth one 
which is the highest one, is called Zoe. Yay! You got a shout out. Is Zoe or Zao in the Greek, it literally means the God life. When Christ here in this scripture says, I've come to give you life, he's not talking about suke. Suke is that soulish thing. He's not talking about life that, that deals with just your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. He's not talking about that kind of life. When he talks about life, he's not talking about the pleasures of life, the riches of this world. When he talks about life, he's not even talking about the manner or the style of your life. When he talks about life, he's talking about the God life. And the God life is not lived, the God life is imparted. It is imparted. Jesus said in the Bible, if you love your suke, or if you love your life here in this world, he says, you will lose it. But if you hate your life in this world, you will find it. To this point, I challenge everybody who's looking, how many of you want the God life? Can I tell you how to get the God life? It's this simple principle. You and I can't make a living. We can only take a living. What do I mean by this? Because life is not a thing. Life is a person. When Christ gave his life for us, our job is not to try and make life. Our job is to take on his life. So from now on, we're not supposed to, I'm making a living. I'm taking a living. I'm taking a life that's not mine, and I'm making it mine. I'm appropriating the life of Christ. Though the life I live is no longer me living it, but Christ living on the inside of me. What is this life? What is this God life? The Bible says that when we accept this God life, we literally become new creatures. And the scripture says all things get passed away all things become new. Now let me explain to you very briefly a little bit about this God life. And I'm going to use, for the sake of time, I'm going to use two volunteers. It can be anybody. Just two of you. Just come on up and stand here. Two men, preferably, actually. Uh, just two men. Thank you. I'm going, to use these, I'm going to use these two men to illustrate this. And I've, I've shared this here before, so I'm, going to, I'm just going to share it very briefly. I'm not trying to teach today. In Genesis chapter 1, God creates Adam, right? He creates Adam in his image in all this. Adam, am I okay here? Is this okay? I'm talking to the camera people. Am I okay here? Adam becomes a citizen of a new life. That life is called the kingdom of God. In that life, he needs to line up with the image to pass the portal. Amen? So God gives him an image. But then in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, God makes what I want to call for the purpose of today a spacesuit. He created a suit for him to exist in this environment. And that spacesuit had a suke, a soul. It had a life. Now, the suke was dead. Help me. Adam didn't even know he had a suke. All Adam knew was that he was an image 
with a life. And that life was in the spirit. So, Adam lived in the spirit and existed in the flesh. Are you following me so far? God then does something. He gives Adam, can I have some money? I'll give it back. Anybody give me some money right now. I promise if I remember you, I'll give it back. If I remember who you are, I'll give it back. Let me give you. Adam then gives, God then gives Adam the legal barter. Some say barter. Or the legal tender. Some say tender. To be able to exchange for goods and services in this realm that he has a passport for. And that was called, hold it, the blessing. Are you following me so far? What is the blessing? The blessing is the currency of heaven. Watch this. When I go to another country, when I was in Portugal, I went to the exchange office and I exchanged my currency, which is only legal in my portal, for the currency of that portal. If I did not exchange my currency, I can live in that realm, but I cannot have any power or influence in that realm. So many Christians are content with being born again and not having any power to exchange with the people in the new portal you've come into. So God gives this man a passport, an image, and a form of tender. The form of tender is called the blessing. He says the only currency you are going to need to, to, to influence this portal called heaven is the blessing. Notice he didn't give him dollars. He didn't give him pounds. He didn't give him euros. The blessing. This man, oh, thank you. I'll give that back. I'm joking. This man is still asleep. Right? Watch this. God says, don't, you can touch anything as long as you're blessed, but don't you dare touch death. In other words, don't you dare trade this for that. So Adam, Eve looks at the fruit and she goes, well, this is real good. I'm going to do this. So she does something. Now let me tell you what she does. She sows into the flesh. Are you getting this? And all of a sudden, the Bible says, and the eyes of them both were open. What's this? This Adam is now asleep. He's dead. This Adam is now awake and alive. He's naked. <laughs> he, he starts to look for covering. All of a sudden, he says to the lion, how are you doing? The lion bites him because he's lost the blessing. Now God says, unfortunately, Adam, you're dead. Adam says, but I'm still alive. But if Adam was still alive, why would God's first question be, Adam, where are you? Hello? Adam had lost his past portal. And he became flesh. He became 
living. He became a being. He had lost the realm of his legal barter, which was the blessing. And now he had become a part of the dust. And God cursed the dust. He blessed the spirit. He cursed the flesh. And he says, hey, Adam, from now on, if you want to get blessed, the same way you sowed in the flesh, you've got to now learn to sow in the spirit. (sighs) Guys, I'm giving you... I'm giving you something here. Look at this. So he says, you're going to toil, you're going to strive, but you're dead. This realm here, Adam looks and goes, but everything still looks okay. No, Adam, this realm is slow death. You are alive, alive, alive forevermore. But now, this was life in you. This is you in life. And now you are dying slowly every single day. And you're going to live your whole life trying to get full, not realizing the only thing that can fill you is be filled with the Spirit. It's the only thing. You'll try every way and you're just going to get frustrated. Man, you'll try and go to work more. You'll try and, and pull more hours just to feel good about yourself. And nothing will fill you. The only thing that fills a soul is Christ Jesus. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I'm not life. I am the life. What life? The life you lost. Look at this. So Adam is here. He is now a suke. He is now living life and responding according to his emotions. And let's, for the purpose of today, now because... Let's call him, my God, I wish I had more time. Let's call him Jacob. Let's call him Esau. Esau has the birthright. Esau has the promise of the God life. Esau meets Jacob one day. And he says, Jacob, I'm hungry. And Jacob says, okay, I'll give you, where is it? I'll give you this. I'll give you this. You've just got to give me the blessing. Because he understood something. That the only, I can have a passport and have no authority. I can have a passport and not even enjoy the life that Christ promised me. Because if I go to Portugal and I pay with this, it's the right currency in the wrong portal. So he says, this does nothing in the spirit. So he says, okay. Okay, fine. You want some food? Go buy yourself some KFC, brother. <laughs> Just give me that blessing. Oh, so he says, okay, fine. Have my birthright. Look at this. Look what happens. Jacob meets his father. Time's up. Jacob meets his father, and his father says this. His father goes, hey. Are you sure you're Jacob? I mean, are you sure you're Esau? You, you, you got the hair. You got the hair of Esau. But you got the voice of Jacob. Are you sure you're the right one? He says, yes. This is what he said. He said, go and get me food. The kind that I like. Look at this. And then... My soul will bless you. Just watch this. He goes away, uses his thing, his currency, buys some lambs and some mutton, 
makes some oxtail stew, brings it back to the Messiah, to, to his father, and his father eats it, and then his father speaks words. 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 But can I tell you what happened in that moment? Words created Zoe life. Jacob could be the poorest man in the world, but anywhere he went, because he exchanged for the blessing, no matter where he went, he prospered. His brother Esau chose death. So no matter where he went, he didn't succeed. Just, just sit down for a second. Give him a round of applause for me. I know, I know my time is up, and I wish, I wish I had more time to dissect this. But if you look at the scripture, everywhere in the Bible, it was two things. Cain and Abel. God rejected Abel. I mean, Cain accepted Abel. Why? What they offered. Can I tell you something? When you and I came into a different kingdom, many of us got the passport. We got the image. But we haven't yet desired the blessing. We're chasing coins and not the blessing. So Jesus meets someone, he says, hey, dude, the guy says, hey, good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, he says well, obey the commandments. He goes, yeah, I've done this since I was a child. Jesus marveled. He says, okay, you lack one thing. What is it? Go sell everything. Your currency does nothing for me. If you, can, if, you can, if you can sow in the spirit, he says, I can transfer a blessing over you that you'll never have to lack again. And the Bible says, and the rich man, having many possessions, seeing that this was a hard thing to do, ah. Oh, Oh, God, I love you, but my God, why, why are you asking me to do this part? Can I tell you the reason why we give, the reason why we sow, the reason why we, we, we give finances is because our finances only work in this realm. They don't work in that realm. And we have a choice. We can be born again and stay born again, or we can accept the born again life. The born again life, and I'm not a prosperity preacher, but let me just say this. God wants to give you an abundant life. Rise to your feet. Let's pray. Come on, just lift your hands right now and just pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just declare, Father, where we have become citizens of another kingdom, but we have not yet lived in the fullness of the authority of that kingdom. Father, Lord, we come to you right now with a heart of repentance where we have counted our pleasures of this world as more worthy than the blessing and where we have sold our birthright for what can only satisfy us for a day, where we have become like the children of Israel who desired leeks and onions over milk and honey. Father God, right now, we repent. And Lord, we choose life. We make a deliberate decision to choose life. Lord, I ask you as we do that, Father God, you said I lay before you life and death, blessings and curses. Father, would you release the blessing upon us? And what is the blessing? The blessing is that which makes you fortunate to be envied. The blessing is that which releases supernatural favor upon you. You know, Malachi says, come to my house and bring your tithe. And listen, I'm not, I'm not interested in, in, in your offering today. I'm just saying this. because it's, It says, bring your tithe into the storehouse and prove me now in this that I will not open the window of heaven. Look at this. And pour you out. Pour out what? 
More money? No. What, more cars? No. The blessing that I can exchange your currency with my currency. The blessing. He says, if you will prove me in this, I will exchange it with the blessing. And the blessing will result in such an outpour that you won't have room enough for it. Father, right now I pray, would you take my church to a place of the abundant life? In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.